because not everybody does client interviews. You don't necessarily have to do that. You can just simply do research and, and your copy will be good enough. But if you collect those, that copy gold, like those things that truly matter to your client, and then your copy reflects those things, well, don't you think it's going to resonate with more clients like them? Because that's what we do, uh, the client interviews and the research and feeding that research into the copy, because we want to attract more of those clients. That's what we want to do and repel all the others. Welcome to the Designers Oasis podcast. I'm your host, Kate Bendewald. If you're tired of one-size-fits-all advice to running your interior design business, you're in the right place. Join me each week as we dive into topics to help you run a thriving interior design business without the hustle. We'll talk about the business of design, but also mindset and mental health, because I know when you thrive, so will your life and business. It wasn't that long ago that I stepped away from my corporate interior design job to build my own design business so that I could realize my own creative dreams, have more time with the people I love, and serve my clients at the highest level while making more money than I ever could have working for someone else. It wasn't always easy, and I made my share of mistakes along the way. Fast forward to today, and I've learned a thing or two. Since then, I've built multiple six-figure interior design businesses on authentic word-of-mouth referrals with many repeat clients. And I want to share it all with you, the ambitious, inspired, and I get it, occasionally overwhelmed interior designer who shares this dream of transforming lives through the art of interior design. You can do this. Thank you for letting me spend part of this day with you. Let's get to it. Hello, my guest today is Masha Koyan, copywriter for interior designers and founder of Content Vertical, where she offers strategic website copywriting services to designers all over the world. Masha uses a data-driven approach to uncover the secrets to what makes your ideal client tick and then write compelling copy that speaks directly to them through your website. Masha joins us today to help designers understand the importance of tailoring your message and how to get started. Hi, Masha. Welcome. How are you today? I'm good, Kate. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm thrilled. I love copywriting, so I can sit here and nerd out on this topic all day long. Um, but I, I'm really glad to have you here today because you're really going to sort of break down the process of um, copywriting for your website and share kind of some insider knowledge that I think is going to be really compelling for our listeners today. Um, but before we get into that, I have to ask you, um, how did you decide to get into the niche of copywriting for interior designers versus other types of professionals? Yeah, no, it's a great question, Kate. So five years ago, about five years ago, when I started my business, I've been doing marketing for 15 to 17 years. Um, prior to launching my business in 2019. And then I started copywriting business thinking that I'm going to write for all kinds of different industries. And, you know, as you know, we start listening to different experts, different gurus, and everybody kept saying, well, the niches and the riches and, uh, or the riches and the niches actually. And I'm like, okay, I need a niche. And I started thinking, who, what kind of industry do I enjoy writing the most for? But I had to try different industries first. And that's what I did in the first year. I tried different industries. Um, one of my first website copywriting clients happened to be an interior design firm in Toronto. And I loved writing copy so much. Of course, I didn't have the process that I do today, like a, sure. a multi-step process. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's now a lot more sophisticated than what it was uh, five years ago. But I, what I what I realized is that I enjoy writing for creative entrepreneurs. I enjoy um, kind of getting to her story, uh, finding out what's her differentiator. So then when it, you know, when it so uh, when it came time to choosing my niche, I'm like, okay, interior design, let's give it a go. And that's how it happened. 
<laughs> I love that so much. And what's really cool is even though we are, you know, in different industries ourselves, you're, you're a writer, we're designers. What you just said is so important to anybody listening that it just doesn't really matter what you're doing as uh, if you're a business owner, or entrepreneur, that the iteration is a part of any business. Like you didn't have it all figured out right away. You didn't have a super polished system. You didn't have all of those things, but you got started and it took iterating and working with these people for you to sort of uncover, oh, this is what I really want to do. And I think there's a lot of pressure that we put on ourselves to have it all figured out right away. And that's just not realistic. So it's it's cool to have that, hear that perspective and story from you to sort of reaffirm like, this is just a part of doing business, being being a business for yourself. Absolutely. And you do have to try a bunch of different things until you realize, okay, this is my process. This is what my business looks like. And, you know, five years later, I'm still making a ton of changes. I don't, right. I don't think it ever stops. I don't think we ever stop growing. I feel like it's a problem if we do, if we have it. Like my husband sometimes tells me when every time I sign up for a new course or a new community, he's like, but you know everything already. <laughs> no, I don't. No, it never stops. You can you continuously kind of upskill and grow your skill and um, hone in and what you're good at and continue evolving your process, what you do, how you serve. Yeah, absolutely. So in Designers Oasis, we've identified four phases of um, being in business and it's uh, <laughs> launching, establishing. Mm -hmm. So launching is like that, just getting started. You're writing that shitty first draft of your website, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Establishing your sort of uh, figuring out exactly who you want to work with. There's so much more to it. I'm not going to get into all of it, but then there's uh, growing and then refining. And that refining mm -hmm. phase to me is like the most fun because you've already got like the wheels in place and things are moving and your business is running, but it's, it's your opportunity to really polish and button up and it's a never ending process. And I think that's really a fun space to, to be in and, and to work and play. So, all right, speaking of refining, I want us to get into this because today we're talking about brand messaging specifically for your website today. You've worked with a lot of designers and I, I'd love to hear your perspective on what, what do you see happening over and over again? What do most designers get wrong when thinking about their approach to revamping their messaging? Mm, that's a great question. I think, well, there are a number of things that I see repeatedly on interior design websites, but I think one of the big ones is when designers, and that goes back, I think, to niching. And I'm not saying you absolutely have to niche, but when you try to speak to everyone, you kind of end up speaking to no one. When you don't have that clear, that clearly defined audience, your message is diluted and it's kind of all over the place. And when you get to the so, for example, here's the, you know, the user experience when you get to somebody's uh, website and you look at the above the fold section. And when you're thinking and trying to understand what exactly is happening here, who are they targeting? Are they targeting me kind of consumer or are there other what's what's the niche here? Um, so lack of clarity and lack of um, identified client avatar, if you if you if you will, that's the biggest one, I think. Yeah, it just sounds kind of, uh, it, to me, almost like impersonal or regurgitated because... Yeah, it's generic, it's, you know, you generic. see, yeah, you see it kind of on all the other websites. And when you're thinking to yourself, okay, how do I, what, what, what do I bring to the table? But your website copy kind of sounds like all the other designers, you know, there's a real opportunity there. Yeah. And so what, what, ha what's, Talk about the results, like when you, first of all, I just want to say to anybody listening, because I know that we have designers who are in all four of those phases of design, right? Where we're not, we don't all fit neatly into one, mm -hmm. one category, one box, but, you know, to the designer who's listening, who's just getting started, you know, you, you might be in that phase where you just have to write that that initial first draft just to get it out there, right? Although Maj is going to share some really exciting and, and specific uh, strategies today. So stick around. But a lot of designers might be in that like refining phase where they're they're realizing, oh, 
Mosh is talking to me because mm-hmm. my what I've got right now doesn't really reflect the designer I've become, the designer I want to be, the the doesn't reflect the kind of people that I really want to be working with. And so, but if you stay stuck in that, if you don't prioritize that, no matter what phase of business you're in, what what happens? What's the result of just allowing that website to not really work for you? It's like what do you what happens to designers when they don't? get their copywriting dialed in. Yeah, you're basically not attracting the ideal client. And just to just to reiterate, it is absolutely fine to be in that stage in that initial stage of business. Yeah. I just like, yeah, exactly. That's that's where we all start. So this month alone, I had two clients that came in and they're in the first five years of their business. And the thing that they come to me with is Nothing on my website resonates. I do not offer any of those services that I put because, you know, when you're just starting out, you're kind of, you know, you have like seven different service offerings. I can do this and uh-huh. this and this uh-huh. and your message and uh-huh. way too many options for your audience. But what do you know? Because what you're worried about is that you're going to not attract clients. So like I said, you know, when you're speaking to everyone, you're speaking to no one. So the, the two clients that came in, they're like, nothing resonates. My business has evolved. Everything changed. None of those service offerings are relevant. I'm now full service interior design. Whereas before I was like the color consultations and this and like Christmas decorating and this and the other. So many different options. And I'm like, it's fine to serve all the, like all that audience and offer this many services, but you don't have to go to market with those. Be known for that one thing. Yeah. You're not going to deter the right traffic. The, the, the traffic, the clients are still going to come to you if you're known for that one thing. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, that's what I see. So it's absolutely fine to go through that stage. We all, uh, we all evolve and grow. And there comes a time where you need to take a look at your website messaging and say, okay, where am I today? Does this copy resonate with the type of client that I want to attract? Does this sound authentic to me? Like, what about my brand voice, my personality? Is it all coming through? Or do I kind of sound like everyone else? Like yeah. if you had, you know, a bunch of different tabs open, or if my clients had a bunch of tabs open, like, what would stick out or, or will I just kind of blend in with everybody else? Yeah. 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 So ultimately the risk, if you don't start to take your brand messaging and your website messaging seriously, is you're going to continue to attract the kind of people that aren't, aren't the kind of people you want to be working with, um, is the direction you're trying to go. Um, but you believe, and I believe too, (laughs) that, you can really turn that around with the right messaging. So where do they start? I think you absolutely need to start what we talked about earlier is knowing and understanding your audience. This is the first step. And if you've gone through any program or spoken with any of the experts, I think this is also one of their steps, kind of identifying that client avatar or, um, you know, there's different terms for that. But making sure that it's not just surface knowledge. We're not just talking about because one of the first questions that I ask in my client questionnaire is like, well, who's your audience? Tell me, tell me about them and they start well it's a male or female and I don't know 40 to 55 that's all good to know but we need more you want to ensure that you understand your audience in depth we're talking about things like what kind of process do they go through when they hire an interior designer and you know what kind of hesitations they may have what kind of questions they may have what do they like what are their needs what are what are their deepest aspirations that they told no one, that they tell no one about and what you could do i think it, it may be awkward asking those questions um, of your clients my my advice is if you're not ready for a copywriter, get your VA or somebody else to kind of interview your clients. It, and it doesn't have to be an interview. It could be an informal chat. The way I set up my interviews, I always call them like very informal chats. You're just trying to get to know your past clients. Um, and that's where you would start. You would start with either your past clients or uh, somebody you aspire to work with and really, really try to gain an in-depth understanding of what are they like? What goes into their decision-making process? Do they look Look at other, um, at your competitors, at other interior designers in the hiring process. What sticks? Like what surprises them? You know, what kind of things are important to them? 
So that's the, yeah. that's the first step. Yeah. Great. I love this so much. And again, thinking about the phases of business, I want to just take a moment to, you know, remind designers that your ideal client or your perfectly aligned client, this is a person, this is an avatar that is, should evolve with your business. That if you haven't looked at this in a while, we would do this every year is really go back and look at that in-depth profile, right? If you don't have an in-depth profile yet, that's a great place to start, but don't think that you just do it once and it's done. It has to be something that you go. And that's, I do this in the interior designers business blueprint. We have a, an in-depth sort of researching your ideal client um, lesson. And I just, I try to beat that message in. It's like, do it, and, but come back to it because if you're evolving and your business is evolving and the kind of people you want to work with is evolving, but you still have copywriting written for that other person that like, it's just, there's a disconnect. There. It's not static. It's just not static, right? We're dynamic yeah. businesses and people. So it should change. So cool. So really getting clear on the person that you're writing for. And um, so what happens next? Because like, are we, are we right? Are we putting pen to paper now or? Absolutely not. <laughs> and, and yeah, there is a lot of research. A lot of preparation goes into it because if you're starting to write already, there's just not enough information to go on. The second mm -hmm. step that I would do is evaluate your current, because a lot of you, a lot of your listeners do have that first shitty draft. You know, that's where we all start. We absolutely have to have that. My own website, I hope nobody goes there right now, but my <laughs> own website needs a lot of work because five years later, mm -hmm. I do need to revamp and I'm in the process of revamping my own website. So the mm -hmm. first, uh, the second thing that I would do is evaluate, kind of do a mini content audit. Like what's working on your website? Where are the sections that require work? See what you said before that, knowing your audience is a kind of iterative process and you have to look at it every year, um, I would do the same thing with your website. See if it's still, who am I speaking with on my in my website messaging? What are the areas that need work? How is my process looking on my services page? Is it kind of like a, a one, two, three step? Is that really, you know, because I'm sure you have an elaborate process. Maybe there needs to be work done on your services page. Mm -hmm. You know, how are my calls to action? Uh, so when you're doing the audit, pay attention to those things. How are the headlines? I will get more into uh, like the essentials uh, on the website. But how are my headlines? Are they, are they communicating what they need to communicate to my ideal audience? Mm -hmm. When my ideal audience gets or visits uh, my website, do they get a clear understanding of what I do, who I serve, how am I different, and do I help them kind of, do I motivate them to take that action to schedule a call? So these are all the things that you have to look at when you go into your web website. And it's hard because sometimes they're just too close to it. So what I would do even get one of your friends. I mean, even if you get one of your past clients, that would be awesome. But if you're not in that position, get one of your friends or a couple of your friends to go to your website and say, hey, what are you, what are you getting here? So I think that's that's what I would, that's the tip that I would do. I think it's so important to get that um, another perspective on your own because yeah. sometimes you're just too close to it. Sure, 100%. Oh, you mentioned headlines a minute ago, and I, I, I would venture to guess that you would somewhat agree with this statement, but tell me if not. The idea of, I always... Uh, abide by the clear over clever when it comes to mm -hmm. writing headlines. But how important is it to you when thinking about those headlines? Um, I, I struggle this I, I struggle with this on my own head line writing copy, website writing copy. Mm -hmm. so this is why I'm asking. How <laughs> much do you emphasize SEO over? having SEO driven headlines over having like something, a headline that is compelling and, and catchy and maybe like hooks, like, like a hook, it brings you in over the SEO piece. Cause I always, you know, SEO driven headlines suck. Like they're just, they, do. they lack emotion. They, uh -huh. I a hundred percent, I would prioritize human writing versus yeah. SEO writing. Having said that, SEO is important and yeah. we need to have the right keywords in place. So 
I would definitely, if I could, if this was, uh, you know, entirely up to me and all the stars are aligned, I would combine the two and create an evocative headline that's partly SEO, that, that's SEO friendly, that has the right keywords in place. But that's not always possible because okay. like the way copywriters write is we take that data that we collect from your clients, that we collect through research, and then we translate that into the headline copy and the rest of the copy on your page. So if I, if this was entirely up to me and if this was possible, I would combine the two. But um, that's not always possible. I would definitely prioritize evocative headlines. So here's the thing. The goal of your headline is to move your audience to take the next step it's not to like communicate everything all the things that you do and all the people that you serve no no just one single step just take one step get me curious enough to yeah. take the next step so having said that integrate the seo keywords into the subheadline or into the eyebrow copy, you know, that line right above the headline. Sometimes we have, so we have eyebrow copy, we have headline, and we have subhead. So in the eyebrow copy, that's where I would typically put it, you know, in New York interior designer or kitchen designer in Seattle, whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. um, but I would infuse that SEO content somewhere in either the subhead or the, um, the eyebrow copy. But the headline, make it evocative, make it so that people feel something. That's the main yeah. job of the headline. Yeah. All right. Well, you reaffirmed that. And I love that. It's like, you don't have to, SEO is important and there's other ways to lean into that um, outside of the headline writing. So that's a, that's a really key takeaway, I think, um, here. If I can add to this as well, um, I know that interior design industry, most people work on referrals. I'm not sure if most would be the right word to say that, to say here, but yeah, many come from referrals. So even if the, the lead is coming from referral, they will still go to your website to check it out, to validate, to kind of see, okay, I just want to make sure I want to vet it. I want to make sure that information that I'm getting from my neighbor or my friend or my colleague is true so that's why here seo plays a lesser role and you want to capture the interest of whoever is visiting your page because if this strong lead is coming from a referral you know you want to make sure it's speaking to him or her yeah right yes no i love that that's such a good point and so true and i'd be quite honestly i'd be um, a little nervous if somebody came to me without checking out my website right <laughs> yeah. like yeah. so you don't really care who you work with that's that's not what I want all right okay so can we talk about some other strategies for because you're what we're really talking about is developing your brand voice and your brand message um yeah. so what are some of those strategies that you like to um help your clients with yeah, absolutely. So definitely starting with strong headlines. So we already know who our audience is. We're then leading into how do we communicate with that ideal client? And what you need to uh, keep in mind is, A, yes, we need to have strong headlines that capture the attention of our ideal clients. And how do we do that? We do that with audience-centric language. So literally using words like you or your, like if you take a look at your website right now, see how many sentences you're starting with we and I, and we do this, and we serve this, and here's what we're good at. It's very you-centric. So what you want to make sure is that your copy speaks uh, to your ideal client. So the goal is your audience feels heard, understood, and seen. Um, and we do that by using audience-centric language. Then we want to embed storytelling into our um, copy, and we do that by various ways, you know, you can, you want to make sure that your brand story comes through on your about page and communicates to your audience what you're all about, where you've come from, what are the different types of experiences you bring to the table, how you arrived here, uh, because your copy needs to connect and engage with the audience. They have to, they absolutely have to feel something. They have to find something that resonates with them. So storytelling is another way to do that. And um, using things like adjectives and power words, there's, there's this whole thing of um, power words. There's like a bank. If you Google power words, you'll get like a bank of 500 or 800 words. You want to make sure you're using those words because sometimes using the right words make us feel something. They are a lot more powerful and they um, 
they evoke a reaction and that's what we want to do. We don't want to just copy to kind of be static. We want to evoke some type of reaction because as you're, you know, sometimes you're reading copy and it's like, okay, okay, okay. But then other times you see copy and it actually resonates again, going back to, you know, if you know your audience well enough, you are working with copy that resonates. You're not only addressing your audience's questions, but you're also anticipating their questions. Because if you've done your research, if you've done all the work to understand your audience, you know what drives them, you know what hesitations they have, you know what objective, that's not, you know, it's not just the price of the investment of interior design. There are right. so many other things that you should be inventing in your copy and yeah. speaking to, to those hesitations, making sure that the, the other person on the other end of the screen actually feels understood is like, oh, okay, yeah, she's mm -hmm. speaking to me. That's the that's the reaction you're trying to get. Exactly. I love that. Yeah. I call it head nodding copy. You want yes, your I ideal client. That. You want your ideal client, if they're reading your website, to be like literally nodding their head like, oh my gosh, this person gets me. This feels I feel seen. How yes. like how can I get on your calendar? <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Um, one of the other things that we cannot forget is calls to action. And mm -hmm. I am always doing um, website audits for uh, some of the leads that come through. And that's what I often see that people forget, calls to action. You can have the most amazing website, but if it's not driving action, mm -hmm. then it's missing out. There's a huge lost opportunity there. And calls to action should be on every page. So Think about your about page. That's the typical page where people forget to put call to action. You know, you're getting this amazing, engaging brand story uh, for your clients to kind of consume, but then they get to the end. What's next? There has to be some type of action. You have to drive, yeah, at that end, you have to drive that behavior. You are, this is your website. You are, you know, the host of the party. You need to guide people like, where do you go next? And you need to guide their behavior. So you absolutely need to include a call to action. Because it's not always immediately clear that you they need to click on the on the contact us button at the top right hand corner. You want to kind of uh, entice them to do that. Yeah. Um okay, side note because or side question, um, because mm -hmm. I know that you help designers by copywriting for websites, but also you offer email um writing services is my understanding so mm -hmm. if you have a, if you're working with a designer and they have both uh or let's say almost every designer is going to have the like book a call with me uh call to action that's pretty typical mm -hmm. um but let's say they also have a lead magnet and that's a different call to action of course we know that lead magnets are designed to capture those people who might not quite be ready to book that call with you, um, but maybe they're still investigating and they just want to learn more. Um, how do you balance the calls to action between booking a call? Because I sort of come from the school of thought, and I'm curious if you agree or you see it differently. I come from the school of thought that, you know, have your lead magnet av available on your homepage, but every other website I or every other page I think at the bottom or wherever it mixed in your call to action mm -hmm. should be to book a book a call with me of course your footer matters too right we can have all that stuff in there yeah. but how do you and this is a question I get from designers and I I don't I don't always know if it's the right way but like balancing the calls to action between booking a call and downloading my guide because that could be a distraction is like the the fear that designers get it's like well the lead magnet is going to be a distraction. Then they're not going to book a call. It's like, well, if you do the lead magnet, right, that's not true because <laughs> you're going to yeah. continue to offer calls to action as once they receive that. So I'm just curious, where do you stand on that? And how do you sort of balance um, not giving the, I, I am over taught, I'm overthinking this, but how do you balance not giving the client too many calls to action and they get confused and they leave and they don't do anything? No, and that's actually a great question, Kate, because the that's the other extreme of not having any calls to action. Sometimes people have way too many calls to action, but that's a delicate balance. So there's primary calls to action, which is in most uh, cases is book a call or you know fill out a contact form, and then there's secondary calls to action, which is the lead magnet or sign up to my e newsletter or I don't know download this guide, whatever the lead magnet is. So 
what what matters is where and how you display this information because as i mentioned earlier it is important to guide your user um mm -hmm. it, through this through this user experience on your website the home page is actually a great place to have your lead magnet so that's you know um i think you're uh, on track with that so all you need to do is just make sure that you are guiding so for example if, if you are on the home page and you're going through you know here's a sh like a little teaser about my services and then it because because don't forget contact us is not the only main um uh call to action your other calls to action on your home page would be to drive people to the other pages because you want to so what your website copy has to do is to kind of work with those stages of awareness because not everybody that gets on your website realizes okay yeah I've always worked with interior designers I know what it's like no not everybody is sometimes you will get people who have never worked or hired an interior designer and you have to provide them enough information to kind of um, help inform them on what to do next or what it's like to work with you. So your first call to action on your homepage would probably be, hey, you want to learn more about my services? Like explore our services. But here's a bit of a spiel about what's it like to work with me. Here's another section about me, what kind of designer I am, who I help, how I help. Then there's another call to action to drive your people to the about page and then there's your lead magnet which absolutely that's that's where it belongs on the home page in most cases on the home page and um it's um uh, it's the same weight as your almost the same weight as your main call to action it deserves to be there you just have to make sure the copy entices people to click on it but they also have to understand if this is what you want to do, if you want to download a lead magnet, this is your uh, compelling reason. And if you want to book a call and skip that whole thing or do both, your, your copy basically right before that call to action has to uh, make sure to manage their expectation and to, to lead that behavior, to guide that behavior. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad you shared this because it's such a good reminder, uh, you know, that, that there's not just one call to action and that, you know, not like you said, not everybody that lands there is gonna be immediately ready. Yeah. No matter how compelling the the copywriting is, some people might need more education, more understanding. And so you can help guide that journey. Um, but what I'm but what I'm also hearing um is that it has to be compelling copy. So yes. Yeah, let's. It, it's not just about a button. You can't just put a button and say, you know, click here or, you know, contact us. That's not compelling enough. And that's, I think that's one of the misconceptions about calls to action. People think, oh, yeah, I have a call to action. Here's the button, contact us or reach out. You want to start your project? Contact us. That's the typical one that I see. Sure. That's not compelling enough. Why? Uh -huh what's in it for me? Like, why do I want to start the project? Have you, um, have you given me enough reason or uh, enough compelling reason to, to make sure that I click that button? That's why copy matters there. So you definitely want to make sure your call to action is not just the button, but it's compelling reason, uh, full of emotion, making me feel something, speaking to my deepest desires or pain points uh, in order for me to click on the button and schedule the call. Hey designer, are you tired of wasting precious time with prospective clients who are not a right fit? Do you experience imposter syndrome because you know the back end of your business is kind of a hot mess? Perhaps you're experiencing growing pains and you don't have the tools, resources, or team to support you. I get it. I've been there. As an ambitious interior design business owner myself, I know the roller coaster ride this can be. Over the years, I've learned a thing or two about running a profitable word of mouth design business, and I want to help you find success too. How would it feel to wake up and face the day knowing exactly what to focus on next? having a roster of enthusiastic clients, including a paid wait list, and having the space, time, and creative energy to develop projects that you are proud of and are portfolio, if not pressworthy. I want to invite you to learn more about the Interior Designers Business Blueprint, a business coaching program designed exclusively for interior designers who want to serve their clients at the highest level while making good money, but without the burnout and overwhelm. 
If you're ready to get off the roller coaster, you don't have to do it alone. Join me inside the Interior Designers Business Blueprint and get the tools, teaching, and community you need to pave the way for an interior design business your clients love and you are proud of. To learn more, grab the link on your audio player or head to designersoasis.com forward slash blueprint. That's designersoasis.com forward slash blueprint. So compelling copy. It's, compelling it's evo copy. it evokes emotion. It gets beneath the surface of what we exactly. sort of typically it engages. showing. So, you know, what their typical pain points, like those external pain points of like, oh, my, my kitchen's too small and I mm -hmm. feel alone when I'm cooking. Well, the deeper underlying reason behind that, this is an example of one of my clients is, oh, well, be, yeah, it's small and it's dysfunctional and we need to fix that. But also like she wants to spend time with her kids who are in high school and are about to leave the nest and go off to college and she feels disconnected from them, right? Like that's the kind of stuff that you can be bringing in through storytelling and that's like getting into the underlying reasons of why they might be there in the first place. I love that you said that getting deeper, truly understanding, because sometimes what our clients tell us is not the reason, is not the real reason. You have to dig so much deeper to understand what are they really saying? It's that thing where I often bring up on podcasts. It's not the good night. It's not the mattress that you're selling. It's the good night's sleep, right? Because what is the reason? What is the real reason your clients want the thing that they want? Oftentimes it's something not entirely different, but it's a lot more, um, a lot more deeper connects to something very personal. And of course it depends on your relationship with your client, how open you are, uh, they are, uh, with you. But I think it's so important to really understand those, those reasons. And that's why I do those client interviews. Cause not everybody does client interviews. You don't necessarily have to do that. You can just simply do research and, and your copy will be good enough. But if you collect those, that copy gold, like those mm -hmm. things that truly matter to your client, and then your copy reflects those things, well, don't you think it's going to resonate with more clients like them? Because that's what we do, uh, the client interviews and the research and mm -hmm. feeding that research into the copy, because we want to attract more of those clients. That's what we want to do and repel all the others. Yes, exactly. Double it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I do have a, I can't remember if it's a podcast or a blog post. It doesn't matter. I have a mm -hmm. resource that I can link in the show notes of, on how to do research to uncover your, your like the, the core desires and pain points of, of clients. So I can add a link to that. But I guess what I'm hearing is like, you know, the, it might be really challenging for designers to want to just sit down and just start writing but that's going to be so much harder if you haven't already done this research and under being able to really crystal clear see who that person is that you want to attract who you like to help how you can help them and that research is just you can't skip that part of this process absolutely not because otherwise um your copy will simply be what other people have on their websites, which is, you know, yeah, we create beautiful and functional spaces. And, you know, we work with family people and, you know, design for fam families in mind, things like that. It's you just need to go a little bit deeper to in order to stand out, which brings me to my next point is finding out what is that unique value proposition that you bring to the table. You absolutely just as much time you're spending on figuring out who your audience is and what do you know about them? You also have to spend time. And this is, I think, uh, a very challenging point for a lot of designers figuring out what's their secret sauce. How are they different? Because when, when you look at it, designers and copywriters are actually very alike. These are two industries and service providers that are so similar because every time we're thinking about, well, what what's so different about me? Um, that's another question that I ask them in my client questionnaire. Well, what's your thing? What are you known for? What do you want to be known for? Well, I'm not sure what's so different. You know, I have this process and I listen to clients and I, you know, but I really listen. And yes, to you, it sounds very different. But to your ideal client, it may sound 
um, that like they've heard that before. So you need to spend some time figuring out what is that unique value proposition. And oftentimes to help you do that, you look at a couple of things. You look at what you do today. You look at all the different experiences that you bring to the table because they all matter. Uh, when I write and when I talk to my clients, they say, well, I spent 10 years doing such and such, but it's not relevant here. I'm like, let's talk about it because it probably is. It's probably very relevant. It could be your yeah. thing. Yeah. You can't spend years doing 10 years of something and have not well, you can't walk away from that having learned nothing like <laughs> transferable skills, you know, transferable skills are just a different perspective on things. And I work with so many designers that, you know, have switched careers and they've done, I don't know, one was, um, uh, in the fashion industry, another one was in something else, a, a teacher. And there's so many things that you can really take those things and, and, and look at it from a different perspective. What kind of skills did I pick up there? How is it relevant to my clients? And then you look at the other side of the things, which is what do my clients need? What resonates with them? And how do I tie it all together and create this succinct, unique value proposition? The thing that sets me apart, the things that uh, makes me memorable, the thing that is different from everyone else. Uh, so that's critical to, uh, before you start writing, to figure out what is your unique value proposition. Yeah. This is why we sometimes need shitty first drafts just to get your website started, because a lot of times you don't know all of these things and it's going to take time to do the research and experience. And, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot you can do if you're just getting started and you've never had a client, but, um, I've just the the thought that goes into your website i think and the the copywriting just as much as the vi the visuals and the uh, um user experience and all of that is the amount of effort that you put into this is going to you're going to directly see the results pay out you know if you if you're not spending the time to do this kind i okay love research and planning is my love language. So hearing you talk about how important it is to do all this front loading before you ever put pen to paper makes so much sense to me. Mm -hmm. Um, and it doesn't have to be painstaking, but, um, and you can get help, you know, Masha can help you with this. So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess, I guess what I'm just hoping to underscore is, you know, and think about, you know, designers listening think about the process that you do with each of your clients in terms of researching who they are and what makes them tick and like even at the project level and what is about the space that isn't working you can't start designing you can't start pulling stuff together without doing that critical pre-design research and you know this deserves the same amount of um i think care and thought when you're doing it if if you want it to have any longevity yeah, absolutely. And I want to go back to one thing that you said. Sometimes you do need to have that experience in order to gather all this knowledge and do enough research. Sometimes you do have to go through a couple of projects to understand, okay, you know, this was not a good client. This was a good client. These are the kind of clients that I want to work with. Now let's look at my process. You know, what worked, what didn't. So you need to have a few projects um, in order to start kind of articulating in order to start crafting this thing, this brand, these processes and systems. So I would say one thing that I often, not to turn business away from me, but I often don't recommend hiring a copywriter um, when you're just starting up because you just simply, you don't have enough experience or if you've never worked with, with clients, like start with that shitty draft. Mm -hmm. That shitty draft is actually the right first step because at least you're putting something, you know, you're putting it into the market, you have the bare minimum and that's good enough. And then, you know, two, three years later or a couple of projects later, you start to understand, huh, I actually don't want to offer half of these services and I don't want to work with, you know, these kind of clients. Once you gain that clarity, yeah. that's the right time to say, okay, maybe I need to now um, think through all of these things and see what my business looks like today and who yeah. do I want to attract today. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Cause it, it can be an, a, a lot of work to do, um, to, you know, pay a copywriter when you 
don't yeah. kind of have any of that historical information. I do, yeah. I do just want to mention there's a couple of strategies that I tell designers to do when they're trying to gather data. So especially if you're in those first, you know, very early stages and maybe don't have a lot, haven't had a lot of client interactions. This is true for anybody really, but curiosity what is your best friend in business. And if you can get in the habit of finding there's so many opportunities to get feedback from clients or prospective clients as you're moving through the process. So you, it's not like you have to do all this data mining and gathering at the end of a project. You can start with every single interaction, every single like key milestone, use it as an opportunity to get feedback. For example, if you have a discovery call with somebody um, and, you know, maybe they decide to not go through with you or a consultation, you know, for example, or maybe you put together a proposal and they don't accept your proposal. Really important, not, you know, first of all, I want you to kind of get through some objections and see if you can't bring them back. But if at the end of the day, it's just not a good fit, I think it's a really important thing to to understand why um, with no strings attached. And look, I'm not trying to get you back. I just want to understand what isn't a fit for you because um, it'll help. It'll help me understand, you know, what I might be able to change or do differently. Um, let's say that you just delivered a concept package design. So a client has now done the initial pre-design work with you. You've done your concept design package and you've delivered to that and you've gotten your feedback on the, the design itself. After a couple of days, you can send them an email or a questionnaire and just say, Hey, we're halfway through the design part of this project. I just want to hear how things are going. What if, what has worked for you? What um, could be better or different? And let's say that they rave and say, oh my gosh, the way you delivered this was so organized. It helped us see the big picture. They will tell you what your secret sauce is. They'll also tell you what needs work if you are willing to ask. Um, right after a presentation, like asking them the same things, like design aside, How's your experience so far working with us together? So you can start to gather this information at every turning point. Also, the client uh, intake forms that come through when they initially um, reach out to you, that is a goldmine of, of words that you can look at to help you understand what, what people are struggling with. So if you're just getting started and you're like, how am I going to do all of this research? This is, this is how, these are some ways that you can start to incorporate it in your everyday practice. This is so amazing. This is such, I, I felt like everything resonated what you just said. And I hope designers are actually doing that because sometimes, you know, when we're um, amidst project and we just get busy and, you know, uh, your clients are asking questions and you're kind of answering, we're going through motions. I think it's so important to take a second and mm -hmm. proactively look for that feedback, what you just yeah. said, and actually record it somewhere. I think that's the key. Actually record it somewhere, save it, because down the road, when this, when you're doing a post-mortem, if you are doing like a post-product evaluation, which you absolutely have to be doing, then, and, yeah. you know, like revising the contract, like make sure to not do that or this, or with every new situation, you know, there's always a lesson. So, you sound like oh, a very experienced interior designer like you you've seen and heard it all by the way <laughs> yeah you have to do that and so yeah so recording have, have like a bank of information or bank of ideas or bank of some type of I don't know like customer touch points customer concerns or feedback and then by the way those um those words that they do say like their immediate feedback that could be a customer testimonial and I love what you said um about the sometimes clients will often tell you what your secret sauce is that's gold that's the whole reason why I do these client interviews because when I'm going through like a 20 page transcript of a half an hour call and a thing keeps popping up where a client would constantly comment on something that's a pattern that's making me think like oh okay so it's not this that they're all excited about uh at the end it's something entirely different and this is your this could be your unique value proposition i yeah i i cannot tell you how many phone calls i've been on you're you're sometimes you're so close to your gift that you can't see it right mm -hmm. and and we i you know the hundreds of designers I've worked with, what I see so often are um, 
just the humility is lovely, but mm-hmm. the, it can sometimes be like, it's like, you can't see your gift and it takes working with somebody to help you pull that out or look for it and then be willing to say, yeah, I actually do that really well. And I just didn't, I didn't think that was a thing. Right. Let me ask yeah. you this question. If if a designer wants to go back and interview maybe a past client, but um, maybe it feels odd or weird for them to do it themselves. Um, like, <laughs> tell me how fabulous I am, right? <laughs> so how, are, what, are, what are some other ways that designers could approach their clients? Uh, or like, who are some other supporting people that might be able to do an interview with them? Is that something yeah. you do or VAs do or both? That's so funny that you asked that. So here's the thing. So yes, you could do a couple of things. And actually, this is one of the service that I, services that I'm starting to offer after I just went, I just came back from a conference in Florida um, where there were like 300 interior designers in the room. And after multiple conversations over lunch, I'm like, huh, like this is the thing that people want. So I should be creating like a separate service for that. So I definitely do have um, a service where I just interview. But funny enough, um, it, it is odd talking to your clients and asking them because sometimes clients may not be as um, honest with you. They may want to tell you the things that you want to hear. And that's not good research, honestly. That's a great customer testimonial, but that is not the thing that I'm searching for, that I'm seeking. So what I just recently did, as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm going through the revamp. I've actually hired a research analyst to for, for her to actually do my own research project. So she's interviewing five of my clients because I am in the process of rewriting website copy. So you absolutely can outsource something like that. You can outsource it to a uh, copywriter. Like I said, I, I would be happy to do that. But if you equip your uh, virtual assistant with the right questions, because half of the battle is actually the right questions. If you're asking them the right questions, you could get really great data. And here's just to give you a a bit of a tip. Uh, Here are the things that you should be looking for. So you're looking for pain points. You're looking in those interviews. If you want to write those down, you're looking for pain points. You're looking to understand, you know, thinking back to um, to before they hired you as an interior designer, what were, what were some of the challenges that uh, you were facing? So this is a good question to include as you're trying to uncover those pain points. Another thing you're looking to uncover is the desires. What is that thing that you want at the end of the day after this interior design project? What are you really after? Um, you're also looking for client affinity. So, you know, what exactly resonated about me as, a, as your interior designer? Uh, what's something that surprised you in working with me? Uh, then we're looking for benefits. Like what are the three, like the three to five benefits of as a result of this, of this project? And we're also looking for beliefs, meaning what did they once believe? before working with a designer that they no longer do because that information is critical once you have that information you can then feed it into your website copy and this is how you anticipate uh questions this is how you overcome people's objections i was so, yeah yeah i was so that's say very the thing the yeah it's like you your website can do so much work for you before you ever get on a phone call. Yes. When you understand that you can address their objections before they ever get on the phone with you. So that by the time they do, they're already, they're, they're there. They just need. They just need a bit to more. Of this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they just need a bit more of you IRL, but, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, your website should be anticipating all of those questions and overcoming yeah. objections, which is why we need to do so much research prior to actually writing. Yeah. Hey, I really think that the designers listening to this right now should be like pausing, (laughs) like go back and re-listen to this, go back. And if you're not ready to hire a copywriter, um, but let's talk about working with a copywriter because I think I, uh, I, I love to write, but I, um, it's not always practical for me with the amount of time that I have Mm -hmm. and the amount of, um, energy that I have and, you know, really just trying to build a business and be out there and meeting people and doing all of those things. Can't do it all. <laughs> I know, I know. And so I am, am truly, truly embracing the reality that just because I can doesn't mean I should 
Oh, I love that. This is actually one of my favorite sayings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So somebody's listening right now and they're thinking, Hmm, I might be at that place where, you know, it just would be more efficient, more effective to work with Masha to help me do this and help me see it through. Um, Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about um, like your just overview of your process? You've kind of given it to us all episode Mm -hmm. long, but where would people start um, if they wanted to think about working with you? Yeah. First things first, just get on my calendar and let's chat. Let's even determine. I'll help you determine if you're even in the right place to outsource because sometimes we're not ready for that kind of investment. We're not ready for that kind of time commitment. We're just not at the stage of our business. So let's hop on the call. You can find the information. I'm sure you'll provide in the notes. But my process is a six-step process. I developed it specifically for interior designers. It's called Reveal. It's a strategic framework for writing website copy. And just like I shared in the most of the, like across this conversation, most of it is research. The first step is research and discovery. And that's where I'm really learning about your brand. What are you all about? What do you bring to the table? What's your differentiator? Oftentimes, I help clients actually determine and articulate that differentiator because they they may have an idea but they don't always know how to put it into words and that's what I help them do at that first stage the second step is extracting key messages and that's message mining that's me looking through all of your stuff your existing message your social media and at this step this is where I'm also trying to capture your brand voice because at the end of the day you want to make sure your copy actually sounds like you and looks like you and feels like you uh, the third step is voice of customer data, which is the client interviews. I interview five of your clients, minus the all the awkwardness, and I position them as informal chats. And believe me, clients love talking about themselves, talking about their project. So this is actually my favorite step in the process. And then the fourth step is evaluating competition. I think it's very important um, to look at who your competitors are, not because we want to, you know, to do the things that they do, but we want to look for gaps and opportunities. We want to make sure we know how did they position themselves What can we do better? What are some of the opportunities that we're missing? And then the fifth step is architecture of content, which is the outline of your entire website before I even write a word of it. So meaning me and you and maybe your website designer align on the key messages that will go. Here's what's going to go on your homepage. Here's what's going to go on your about page, on your services page. Here's how we're going to make it stand out. What are the headlines? All the things that before we even write. Once you sign off on that, and that's how I, by the way, that's how I make sure that there's, it's never a surprise when you get your website copy, because the step before we actually align on what's going to go on your website. Exactly. And the last step is writing. Then that's it. I love a good framework. And that is a really clear one that uh, I also think makes a lot of sense. Reveal. Cool. I love yeah. that. Yeah. I wanted to play in words. Yeah. Oh, it's so smart. Um, cool. I do understand before we go, you do have a free gift that you have to offer interior designers. Can you share a little bit about what that is? Absolutely. And it's a mini audit of your messaging on your website. And it's like I said, it's designed specifically for interior designers. And if you uh, fill out my form, give me your uh, website URL and the number one re- number one thing that's not working on your website, I will actually deliver a personalized video with three strategic tweaks that you can do right now uh, on your website to make a bigger impact. I just have to say that is one of the most generous uh, offers I've ever heard someone. And I will just say that, like, this is a limited time offer perhaps. So yes. if you're listening to, if it's currently available, um, but if you're listening to this in a year or two, I, um, you know, it may not be available, that, but that, definitely that, available yeah. right now. <laughs> so you might as well take advantage of this, um, incredibly generous offer. Um, because I think what a, what a huge, uh, hugely impactful thing to have is like, have a professional, you know, sort of review your, um, review your offer. So, um, cool. Where can people find you, Masha? Yeah, I'm mostly hanging out on Instagram. That's where I share daily tips, strategies, all things, messaging, client stories, everything, you name it. And it's Masha.copywriter. So find me there. Let's become friends. Let's connect. I love that so much. All right. We'll be sure to link to that in the show notes. Cool. Is there anything else you want to share with designers before we head out for the day? 
I think the most important thing after we've covered all of these things is just to be strategic and plan, like be realistic about how you're planning this, uh, this project, because, you know, revamping your website is a huge undertaking. So you have to be strategic. You have to actually plan it out. Like with everything, when you break down the thing, the big thing into smaller things, it's a lot more easier and assign deadlines. That's the key. Assign deadlines, you know, first you plan, then you research, then you write, then you launch. There's, you have to be strategic and realistic about how much time you're willing to commit to this. No truer words have been spoken. This this girl right here needs a deadline. If I don't have a deadline, it's not going to happen. So that's right. That's right. So smart, Masha. Thank you so much for your time and all of this wonderful knowledge that you shared with us today. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Talk to you soon. Thanks so much, Kate. Love it. Love it. Bye. Bye. Hey friend, thank you so much for letting me spend a part of this day with you. I'm so passionate about helping designers like you, and I believe in a rising tide that when one of us does well, we all do better. So if you share this attitude of abundance with me, I want you to do just one little thing. Please share this episode with someone you think might love it. And if you're feeling extra generous today, go ahead and take just 30 seconds to open your podcast app and leave us a five-star rating and review. It's free for you to do, and it helps me to be able to keep making more episodes and resources for you. However you choose to help, please know I appreciate you so very much. Thank you, my friend. Have a wonderful rest of your day. I'll see you soon.